Hello, everybody, and welcome to stage B. Um, I'm Tear Fothergill. I'm your herald at the moment, and uh, and this could change at any moment. You never know. Um, <laughs> we're going to have a talk by Jane Charlesworth on Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, but first, I would like to say, if you are in the first two rows, there is every chance that you might end up on the stream. And if you don't want your likeness to be used, please move out of the first two rows. Um, and then also, please, please, please consider volunteering to be a herald or to park other people's cars or to do other very exciting things for EMF camp because it is volunteer run um, and we'd be very grateful for some help right about now. Uh, at any rate, without further ado, Jane Charlesworth on Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, thank you. Um, hello. Um, I'm afraid I forgot to buy pickles. My plan was to buy some free pickles and p pass them around, and I completely forgot, and I'm really sorry. Um, anyway, why have a talk about a science fiction writer at a sort of hackerspace festival? Well, my argument for that is that obviously science fiction helped us imagine different worlds and different possible futures, and I think Ursula Le Guin is a writer who really exemplifies that role that science fiction can play in imagining different societies. I also think that she was a very curious person, not just as a writer, but in general, and that she's someone that would have probably really enjoyed an event like EMF. Um, so I thought it was fitting to do a tribute to her work here. So obviously I've, I haven't read everything that she's written, and I hope there are lots of undiscovered gems that I won't be talking about here today. But she's one of my favorite writers, and I just thought it would be nice to do a talk sort of celebrating that. So I'm going to sort of talk about some of her works that I've really enjoyed, um, and a few quotes, and hopefully illustrate why I think she's a great writer, why I think she's very relevant for people who are very curious, and why everyone should read her work. So, hopefully her words will really speak for themselves in this talk, and I'll do a little bit of comment. So, the, the first book that I read by Ursula Le Guin was The Wizard of Earthsea, and I read a lot of fantasy. I think that, do you want to take this mic for now? And, well, I'll take this back. Sorry about that. Um, I read a lot of fantasy books as a child, but this was one that really stuck with me because it felt like the characters were much more sort of complicated human characters than in a lot of fantasy books. So in, in most fantasy books, you basically have someone fighting a big bad, and you have good guys and you have bad guys. It's all really clear cut. But in A Wizard of Earthsea, it really isn't because the main character is fighting a big evil, but it's a big evil that comes out of himself. So it's a little bit different. It really subverts those fantasy tropes. So without being too spoilery, it's kind of the story of this boy called Ged, who is born as a goat herd, living in a very rural location in a sort of island archipelago. And he turns out to be very talented at sorcery. He starts learning magic from his aunt, who is the local um, witch in the village, and then goes away to train at a wizard school. So, similar to, to some other popular books there. So, anyway, he, he's sort of top of his class at the wizard school, but like a lot of geeks, he's not very good socially. So he's, he's really awkward and he's plagued by jealousy. And in particular, he's jealous of this other boy that he thinks is better than him. He's a bit older, he's a bit posh. And this, this whole horrible jealous mess winds up into Ged casting a spell that is a very poor decision and releasing this evil onto the world. And then the rest of the book is him sort of dealing with that. So just to, I think this really sums it up. It's that he, he didn't lose or win, but he, by naming the shadow of death with his own name, had made himself whole, a man who, knowing his true self, cannot be used or possessed by any power other than himself, and whose life, therefore, is lived for life's sake, and never in the, hate, in the service of ruin or pain or hatred or the dark. So he's really goes through this whole process, and it's learning about himself. It's not this very black and white good and evil narrative. 
And she even goes on and explains this choice as a deliberate choice in the sort of afterword to the book. So um, again, I'm just going to read these quotes in case anyone can't read them on the screen there. So war, as a more metaphor, is limited, limiting, and dangerous. By reducing the choices of action to a war against whatever it is, you divide the world into me or us, good, and them or it, bad, and reduce the ethical complexity and moral richness of our life to yes, no, on, off. This is puerile, misleading, and degrading. In stories, it evades any solution but violence and offers the reader mere infantile reassurance. All too often, the heroes of such fantasies behave exactly as the villains do, acting with mindless violence, but the hero is on the right side and therefore will win. Right makes might. And I think this is just a really important message to, to consider, especially in a world where we seem to be bombarded by people who are trying to position us as good or bad and them or us. Um, the other thing that Ursula Le Guin did right from the beginning of her works with Ursi is that her protagonists are deliberately described as non-white. So she said she was in an interview that she was tired of all these white heroes and she wanted to write characters that represented the diversity of humans that live in the world. Um, and that's something that I think she was one of the first writers to really do and talk about as a deliberate choice. Um, the Earthsea books aren't really, like the earlier Earthsea books are kind of not without their problematic elements. So in A Wizard of Earthsea in particular, the women are kind of generally in helper roles. The women's magic is sort of described as less than the men's magic, uh, a bit problematic. And it's it falls into those sort of traditional masculine tropes. But this is something that she came back to in the later Earthsea books, in particular... Uh, in Tehanu, where she is in the same world, but she's considering things from the women's perspective and thinking about what women's magic looks like. And I think that's really a reflection of her thinking about feminism and gender and how she moved on in her own thinking that she did that. I'll come back to that a little bit later. But in Tehanu, she's, she's talking about the women and what the women's magic might be like. So here's, here's one quote that I really liked. So ours is only a little power, it seems like, next to theirs, Moss said. But it goes down deep. It's all roots. It's like an old blackberry thicket. And a wizard's power is like a fir tree, maybe. Great and tall and grand, but it'll blow right down in a storm. And nothing kills a blackberry bramble. I, I really like that description. So another thing that a theme that I'll try and come back to because it's what Ursula Le Guin really comes back to in a lot of her works is talking about trust and power and the balance of trust and power and what these things look like. So in this case, talking about men and women, and I, th I just thought this was very interesting coming back to this. So why are men afraid of women? If your strength is only in the other's weakness, you live in fear, Ged said. Yes, but women seem to live their own strength to be afraid of themselves. Are they ever taught to trust themselves, Ged said. And as he spoke, Thera came in. Sorry, I should explain the, the three characters here is Ged, who is the main character of the Wizard of Earthsea, Tenar, who is a high priestess and was in the, I think, the second Earthsea book, and Thero, who is a child that she's caring for. Um, as he spoke, Thero came in on her work again. His eyes and ten eyes met. No, she said, trust is not what we're taught. She watched the child stack the wood in the box. If power were trust, she said, I like that word. If it weren't all these arrangements, one above the other, kings and masters and majors and owners, it all seems so unnecessary. Real power, real freedom would lie in trust, not force. And I think these are re really interesting ideas that she she talks about and comes back to in a lot of her works. Uh, so the next book I'm going to talk about a little bit is The Left Hand of Darkness, which kind of made Ursula Le Guin's a reputation as a feminist writer. So this book is set on a ice planet. So it's part of a cycle of books called the Hainish Cycle. They are 
lovely, lovely books, and you can buy a lovely hardback collected edition of all of the books and stories that are loosely grouped into the Hainish cycle, um, which I highly recommend because some of her earlier books are out of print but are very much worth reading. So her parents were anthropologists and she kind of grew up, I think, in Berkeley, California, surrounded by these anthropologists and people. And I think a lot of that comes into her books. So a lot of the books in this Hainish cycle are about people from different worlds going and making contact or different societies meeting and trying to understand each other. And in the left hand of darkness, we have a human um, sort of envoy ambassador called Genli Ai, and he's come to this world called Gethin, which is an ice planet. And the kind of notable feature about the people on this planet is that they um, are mostly without gender. So for most of their, so most of their life cycle, they don't have a gender. And then they go into a mating phase where they kind of randomly become male or female. But it can happen to anyone. So the consequences of this sort of randomness of it is that essentially anyone could end up becoming pregnant. So at one point in the book, the king becomes pregnant. And so this is a really useful framework that she uses to think about what this kind of society would look like. So for example, in this society, sex can only occur when both partners are in this chema or mating phase. So all sex on this planet is consensual. And if you go into this chemo phase, you then can go to a chemo house and find a partner. And it's a sort of, it's, it's just very different. Um, although in some cases, there are some people that have different issues with this. And th those are, I would say looking at it now, some of those things maybe strike us as a bit problematic. So some people have differences in this cycle and they d get described as outcasts or perverts. And on this planet, there also hasn't been any war, which Genli, the visitor, attributes to their um, lack of sort of masculine nature. But it could also be that they live on this icy planet and the rate of progress in their society is very slow because of the climate they live in. So this is um, from a, a quote from a previous visitor to the planet who's just sort of describing the inhabitants. So the Cathenians do not see one another as men or women. This is almost impossible for our imaginations to accept. After all, what is the first question we ask about a newborn baby? There is no division of humanity into strong and weak halves, protected or protective. One is respected and judged only as a human being. You cannot cast a Gathenian in the role of man or woman while adopting towards him a corresponding role dependent on your expectations of the interactions between persons of the same or opposite sex. It is an appalling experience for a Terran. Uh, personally, I think that would be lovely. <laughs> but I, that, that really seems like it would be absolutely brilliant. But um, And the fact that everyone between 17 and 35 or so is liable to be, as Nim put it, tied down to childbearing, implies that no one is quite so thoroughly tied down here as women elsewhere are likely to be, psychologically or physically. Burden and privilege are shared out pretty equally. Everybody has the same risk to run or choice to make. Therefore, nobody here is quite so free as a free male anywhere else. I think that sounds lovely. Um, so I think that I really like this book for a lot of reasons. Um, but I think the best part of the book comes for me when this chap, Genli, who's visiting, and he's really struggled to fit in. So his name sounds like someone crying out in pain in their language. And he, he looks different. He's taller and he's darker skinned than the average Gathenian on this planet. Um, and he just really struggles with it, all of his interactions because he is thinking in this very gendered framework. So he, he can't interpret people's behavior except through this gender binary. And so he, 
he gets into all kinds of awkward situations. But um, the latter half of the book is really describing him kind of going on a journey with this other guy and it their sort of deepening relationship. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it, but it's he suddenly comes to an understanding about how to view these people and and it's it's just really lovely so i just want to illustrate it with this quote here so and then i saw again and for good what i had always been afraid to see and pretended not to see in him that he was a woman as well as a man any need to explain the sources of that fear vanished with the fear what i was left with was at last acceptance of him as he was until then, I had rejected him, refused him his own reality. He had been quite right to say that he, the only person on Gethin who trusted me, was the only Gethinian I distrusted. For he was the only one who had entirely accepted me as a human being, who had liked me personally and given me entire personal loyalty, and who therefore had demanded of me an equal degree of recognition, of acceptance. I had not been willing to give it. I had been afraid to give it. I had not wanted to give my trust, my friendship, to a man who was a woman, a woman who was a man. And then this just changed, shifts everything in their relationship, and it's really, it's really beautiful. So the next book I'm going to talk about is possibly my favorite book of all time, um, The Dispossessed. So again, this is kind of, a similar conceit where we have someone going into a, a different culture. So this is a story of two worlds. There's Anaris, which is a moon, and it is a anarchist society. And the scientist who gets kind of disenchanted with his home world, and he goes to visit the sort of founding world that the rebels came from to found the world that he lives on which is called Urus, and it's a very different type of society. So he's, there's a lot of thinking about different societies and how we structure societies and what that means. And if there's one quote from Ursula Gwynn that I really kind of come back to all the time, and it's, it's really shaped a lot of my beliefs, it's probably this one. So. For we each of us deserve everything, every luxury that was ever piled in the tombs of the dead kings, and we each of us deserve nothing, not a mouthful of bread in hunger. Have we not eaten while another starved? Will you punish us for that? Will you reward us for the virtue of starving while others ate? No man earns punishment, no man earns reward. Free your mind of the idea of deserving, the idea of earning, and you will begin to be able to think. And I think that, I just feel that's really powerful and um, it, it this reading this kind of clarified that for for me personally and um, it's yeah I posted this on Facebook once and this dude that I was dating popped up to tell me that he thought it was stupid and that I was completely wrong and that we all deserve things and he was actually a pretty terrible person, so when Facebook pops that up as a memory, it's just a reminder that I don't want to be friends with someone that has these ideas about how some people deserve more than others. Um, the other thing I really love about The Dispossessed is that the main character is a scientist, and he just feels so Shevik, and he just feels so much more realized than most scientist characters in science fiction. So he has this like this whole vivid interior life, and I feel that that's often, at least in especially in the early science fiction, something that was maybe a bit lacking. And this quote about visiting the university and how this process of science works is just something that I um also really like, I'm a scientist, and I think collaboration in science is very, very important, and this quote really sums that up. So, physicists, mathematicians, astronomers, logicians, biologists, all were here at the university, and they came to him, or he went to them, and they talked, and new worlds were born of their talking. It is of the nature of idea to be communicated, written, spoken, done, 
The idea is like grass, it craves light, like crowd, likes crowds, thrives on cross-breeding, grows better for being stepped on. I think that just really sums up the process of working as a scientist and collaborating with people. And here's another quote that I just really like and that I come back to when I struggle to feel like I don't fit in in the world. So it's always easier not to think for oneself. Find a nice safe hierarchy and settle in. Don't make changes, don't risk disapproval, don't upset your syndics. It's always easiest to let yourself be governed. There's a point around age 20 when you have to choose whether to be like everybody else the rest of your life or make a virtue of your peculiarities. Those who build walls are their own prisoners. I'm going to go fulfill my proper function in the social organism. I'm going to go on build walls. Um, in a later interview, Ursula Le Guin revised that age from uh, 20 up to about 35. So, she, so I don't know if that if that's comforting to anyone else, but it was for me. Um, and the other thing I think is really extraordinary about The Dispossessed is thinking about the context in which it was written. So she's a relatively privileged white American lady um, writing in 1974 about an anarchist state. And it kind of makes parallels with these real world communist states, especially for, I think Cuba comes to mind for me in the description really difficult to ignore. So it's these questions of who is free and who is oppressed and which side of the border is cut off from the other worlds. And I don't think it necessarily comes down to the conclusion that one one form of society is better. I think that Shevek, the scientist, goes away and visits this other world and comes back. And I don't think there's a conclusion that one way of living is better. But it's just... Um, this quote, which is the opening line of the book, I think is just really powerful in making us think about our place in the world. And I think for an American writer, that's an incredibly bold thing to do. So there was a wall. It did not look important. It was built of uncut rocks, roughly mortared. An adult could look right over it, and even a child could climb it. Where it crossed the roadway, Instead of having a gate, it degenerated into mere geometry, a line, an idea of boundary. But the idea was real. It was important. For seven generations, there had been nothing on the world more important than that wall. Like all walls, it was ambiguous, two-faced. What was inside and what was outside depended on which side of it you were on. I think that's just a really powerful way of thinking about our place in the world and how everything that we do, we do through a lens of perspective of the society that we're in. Um, and again, for this visitor from an anarchist society going into a more structured society, it's a huge culture shock and I feel this is kind of terrifying but possibly closer to the way that our world works. So. There is no way to act rightly with a clear heart on earth. There is nothing you can do that profit does not enter into and fear of loss and the wish for power. You cannot say good morning without knowing which one of you is superior to the other or trying to prove it. You cannot act like a brother to other people. You must manipulate them or command them or obey them or trick them. You cannot touch another person, yet they will not leave you alone. There is no freedom. It is a box. Urus is a box, a package, with all the beautiful wrapping of blue sky and meadows and forests and great cities. And you open the box, and what is inside it? A black cellar full of dust and a dead man. A man whose hand was shot off because he held it out to others. I have been in hell at last. Desar was right. It is Urus. Hell is Urus. Um, so that brings me on to the next um, thing I'm going to talk about, which is... Uh, Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, the next I'm going to talk about really quickly is uh, another story, which is it's in the short story collection. I really recommend all of her short stories. They're brilliant. Um, uh, story, the ones who walk away from Omelas. And again, it's considering the idea about how societies are built on compromises. I don't want to spoiler exactly what the compromise is, but if it describes this utopian 
society with a terrible cost and how if you dig deep enough there will always be a a cost um, so yeah I think I'll leave it to that for the moment um, so I was just going to talk very quickly about some of her nonfiction oh hang on sorry I've messed that up let me just skip very quickly. So just a couple of other things why she was really cool. She refused to blurb a book that was an all-male anthology of writers. She just said, no, gentlemen, I don't belong here. And she, she was quite activist in a lot of ways. Um, and just to, this is coming, coming back to the dispossessed, so, uh, not the, the left hand of darkness. So when she wrote The Left Hand of Darkness, she used a male pronoun as default. and this opened up discussion about that. And at first she was a bit defensive and then she thought about it some more and she said, no, I still dislike, dislike using invented pronouns, but I do now dislike them less than the so-called generic pronoun of he, which does in fact exclude women from discourse. And she said, we should use they, them, and their as a, as a default pronoun. And she, in thinking about that, she said, well, I didn't want to rewrite the book because I wanted to let it stand for itself. Um, but I, I'm happy to document my change, but keep the old book to sort of stand as the evidence. And in thinking about this further, she wrote a later essay where she actually went as far as to say, I am a man, and was talking about how the only kind of person to be was a man, and she was trying to be this male kind of person. It's a really great essay. Um, I, I really recommend checking it out if you haven't read it. So I'm going really quickly because I'm just trying to skim past these things. Um, again, this speech as well I think is really, really lovely. So it was a speech to women at the Bryn Mawr College. And um, she's just talking about the power of women's voices and telling women to go out there and erupt. And it's just really beautiful. And a, a couple of years ago, she was talking at this speech at the National Book Awards. So she was at, and this, at this quote on the kind of power of resistance and change and the power of art to invoke resistance and change is just really, really lovely. And it's something that I come back to a lot because things feel hopeless and reading something like this really makes me feel that there's hope in the world. Um, yeah, so yeah, the title from this talk came from this interview that I read with her where she had some really great answers to a lot of questions, but this is probably my favorite answer to an interview question ever, which was, if you could make a change to anything you've written, what would it be? And she said, in the dispossessed, I would mention the communal pickle barrels at street corners in the big towns. <laughs> I knew about them all along, but I never fitted them into the book. Um, and I don't know, I just thought that was really, really adorable. And I was like, I already love you as a writer, and I think I've fallen in love with you a little bit more as a writer reading that. Um, so, yeah. That's, thank you. Thank you. Favorite. I would say The Dispossessed, that's my favorite book, um, or The Left Hand of Darkness, but you can get both of them in the collected Hainish novels and stories, and it's, and it's really interesting to see how she's developed. But.
Oh, Anne Lecky. I think that's the point, sir. So she said she said has said in various interviews that she wasn't she doesn't regard herself as an anarchist at all. So she said, Oh, I'm just a bourgeois housewife. I don't think I'm qualified to be an anarchist. I've just read some theory. Um, <laughs> so but I mean I think yeah. I think it's more like she doesn't necessarily come down on the on the side of capitalism or anarchism. It's more like we just need to be curious and keep trying to change and try to iterate things and not get stuck in rigid dogmas. I don't know if that really answered your question there. Yes. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I didn't really go into that at all, but yeah, absolutely. I think it does. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.